seated and children are dismissed. All right. Great. We had four men bands today. <laughs> here today. I don't know if they help or not. You guys like them. Keep doing them. It's easier than flipping in your Bible all over the place, I think, to have some verses up here. So. But uh, today we're preaching on uh, Paul's last days. And uh, I tell you, the more I study about the Paul, the more it challenges my faith to, to step up, to stand stronger, and to really walk out in boldness like Paul did. I mean, the more I see about Paul, the more I'm just in awe. Like, this guy... He really kept stepping out. There wasn't any hindrance. There wasn't a bunch of repeated falls. There wasn't a, a weak faith. He had a very strong faith that he shows in everything. And uh, what we're talking about today is uh, basically we can sum up the whole book of 2 Timothy as his last will and testament. In times past, people often witnessed the last words of a loved one before he died. And a long time ago, you know, people would be around the people that died if, if there, was, there was time for them to be around them. It says, watching at the bedside, the family heard words of advice or whispers of love, perhaps a few regrets. Of one thing you can be sure, no one talked about their car or business success or what stocks were on the rise. People who knew that the words they speak are possibly their last usually focus on serious matters. They measure their words carefully. And that's how this whole book of 2 Timothy is. It's like Paul's last letter that we know about that was ever written while he was in jail. And I have a a few, few notes here before we get started in the scripture is one guy I like a lot, like Charles Spurgeon a lot, he was a, called the Prince of Preachers. They say that there was no preacher ever as well known as Charles Spurgeon. He was in the 1800s and Charles Spurgeon had what they called the downgrade controversy going on in the end of his life. He only lived to be 50 something. He didn't live to be that old. He started off as a young man, got saved at like 18 years old. Never went to college, but he read a book every single day of his life. And he's written so many books that it's like, I don't know. I don't know how many books it is, but it's a giant library. It's just, just an enormous amount of stuff he wrote as well as always reading. And uh, he was just always trying to learn, always trying to grow his faith constantly. And uh, the downgrade controversy that surrounded Charles Spurgeon was kind of, to me, it kind of sounded like the same thing that happened to Paul. Because Paul in his last days, everybody left him except for Luke. Luke was the only person who wrote the book of Acts and, uh, and who, uh, who was with Paul that was really, was really with him. No one was even there anymore. And what happened at Downgrade Controversy was Charles Spurgeon was a Baptist in the thing called the Baptist Union, was his denomination. He'd been in his whole life. He loved it. And then toward the end of it, everybody was worried about trying to get more people, trying to just attract more people, that they basically let all their doctrines, all the teachings of the Bible and their standards go, except for Jesus. And that was it. And Charles Spurgeon was like, no, we can't ignore the Bible. We can't ignore the Word. We can't just forget all this so just we can attract more people. We've got to preach the Word. And that's, that's what Paul, uh, Tim, Paul says here, too, in the... In chapter 4, he says, preach the word. Now, that's the so important thing that we preach the word. And because of that, his Baptist union left him. He was out of it. He was a lone guy in the last few years of his life right there just preaching. But he stood up for what was right. And then later, when things went to be back more conservative again, everything goes in ups and downs, it seems like. Everybody remembered Charles Spurgeon. They remembered what he said. And they were thankful that a man stood up in the midst of the storm. When everybody just wanted to compromise, he stood up and stayed strong all the way through to the end. And then, uh, and then also I was reading about that there was actually a place that you can go visit and uh, where Paul was in this dungeon where he wrote this letter at. And they said, you can actually go to this place and get in the dungeon. And all it is, they said it's a half of a one car garage is the size of it. It has one little hole in the top of the ceiling where they would drop the prisoner down in. And there was like a deep, dark, damp dungeon and they said they would put up to 40 people in this one little half-car garage thing at times right there as a prisoner. And that's where Paul spent his last days inside this area. And then uh, I also looked at this and I thought as we look at how Paul laid his life out and how he talked about it, there's something in counseling that I like a lot. It's called playing the movie forward. It's a technique for counseling. A technique for counseling that if you meet somebody and they're in a certain area in their life, 
and they and they aspire to be in another area in their life and they have like a goal, they have a dream, they have a vision where they want to be. They've got to look at the area in their life and now and what kind of steps are they making right here and now that will get them toward their goal. If they're doing things that have nothing to do with their goal in life, why would they think that would end up like that? It'd be like us watching a movie and if we're watching a movie and say some guy wants to be a, a architect one day, you know, then we were thinking the movie sometime he has to go to architect school. He's probably got to spend some time studying architecture. He's got to spend some time with other architects. He's got to do all these things. If he's just spending his time drinking beer, doing other things, not even caring, this guy is never going to get to his end goal. He's got to be following the track, the same track to get on to that goal. And that's what uh, I think Paul Kind of, we can see this as a demonstration as well, too. You know, Paul, back in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he said he hoped that he would not faint, that he would finish strong, you know, that, you know, lest he must be careful, lest, lest he, you know, fall in his own words and, you know, fail himself. That he's got to keep on and stay strong. And we see here that he did keep on and he stayed strong because he stayed in the track and he followed the track and he didn't give up the entire way. And then that leads to that point about conversion. Conversion is necessary for salvation. We all must be converted. We must be born again. And conversion is a one-time act, you know, when God first converts us, but it's also a lifetime act. It's a lifetime of being converted. None of us, the day we get saved, are perfect at that point. None of us are perfect at any point in our lives. It won't be until we're taken up into glory that we're without sin, you know, completely from doing sins. Our sins are covered by Jesus when we're converted. He paid for them on the cross. But yet, conversion is a lifetime act and a lifetime walk. And we can see that also through this book of Timothy. And uh, the question we have to ask ourselves too, are we living our lives to God in a way that when we face imminent death, we can say, I have kept the faith. Because that's what Paul said. Paul said at the end here, we'll see. He said, I have kept the faith. And that really is uh, probably one of the, the most critical criteria in our life. Can we say at the end of our lives, I have kept the faith. You know, I've been walking and I've kept this faith where I started with Christ and I'm not going to lose it. And uh, then I wrote, uh, you know, we should be able to say that. And if we have to ask ourselves, is our life all about us or is it all about him? And when we look at Paul's life, we can see over and over again, it was all about Jesus. Paul sacrificed everything in life for Christ. So we'll go ahead and we'll We'll get started right here in uh, 2 Timothy. You know me, I like to have a little extra notes, and I was writing my Bible, and I'm used to looking at it up there, so now I've got it over here. <laughs> but, uh, but here in 2 Timothy, I've got these, uh, these scriptures right here. If you want to turn to it, or you don't have to turn if you want to just read it, if you can see it. If for some reason you can't read it, let me know later, and I'll make it bigger next time. Okay? It says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. And then, isn't that beautiful? This is basically the beginning of Timothy. You know, this reason, that reason it's named Timothy is because there was a guy named Timothy that Paul was discipling, that he was raising up because he knew there would be a time when he would die and go on, and he wanted someone else to carry on the work. And Timothy was one of the guys and he was discipling like this. So he's writing this letter to Timothy, and he's telling him, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. You know, don't be ashamed of Jesus. And, and how many times, uh, you know, that we could, we could feel ashamed. They said, it said, nor of me as his prisoner. And, and he was truly a prisoner at this time. Paul was in this deep, dark dungeon. He was a prisoner. Everybody else had left him. We could kind of think about it. Maybe we could know some Christian that stands up for something that's right, and they get thrown in jail. And then the general population would be like, we don't want to talk to this guy in jail. You know, he's a, he's a criminal. He's in jail. Well, if he was a criminal for Jesus Christ, we should not be ashamed of this guy. And we shouldn't walk away from him. And we should be just as bold as whoever that fellow was who went to jail and proclaiming the gospel. Just like Paul did right here. And he said, too, that we share in the suffering for the gospel. And there, there's 
definitely suffering for the gospel. If we live in this world and we try to be comfortable in this world, we are not pleasing to God. It says in the Bible that to be friends with this world is to be an enemy of God. So we can't be one foot in the world and one foot in the church and think that we're fine. We've got to be both foots in the church, and yet we live in the world, but it's not just church time that we serve God. We serve God every single day of our lives, every morning we wake up, every day as we go to work, every night as we go to bed. And we should always have both feet planted on that firm rock of our salvation on Jesus and be standing for the faith at all times. It shows here, I, I, wrote, I wrote a few notes out here, that, uh, that we should also join him. You see here it, say, it, says that, uh, it says that we should actually join him in his, in, in his call right here. And let me see what it says. I'm reading with a different version right here. But uh, it, says, uh, it says that... Uh, um, verse 8. Verse 8 right there. Am I, am I right here? If you got your Bible open, it's, yeah, verse 8. It says, it says, of me as prisoner, but join me in the suffering. So, you know, but here it says, share in the suffering. The other versions say, join him. You know, we should join him and be with him in this suffering, this walk. And uh, another thing is, shame shows itself through silence. You know, we can't, if somebody's talking bad about the Christian faith, or all kinds of crazy things about Christ, and we're just silent, we don't say anything, that's like being ashamed of Christ. It's like us showing our shame by just being silent. Because a lot of times people may know that you're a believer, they may know who you are, but you just sit there and you keep your mouth shut when someone is, is bad railing God or talking a bunch of false lies or different things. It's like you're ashamed. It's like, I don't want to stand up for the truth. I don't want to stand up for what I believe in. And it's something that we shouldn't be. We should not be ashamed of the gospel. And, uh, and, then, and then we've got to remember that our first... Loyalty and duty is to the household of faith. Our first loyalty and duty is to Christ and Christ alone. He's our king. He's our master. It's not just so many times a day people take the word Lord and they just misuse it. And they think of it, Lord is my friend. Lord is just like, here's my buddy. Lord is all powerful God. He's the master of the universe. He's the creator of all things. And he's also going to be the destroyer of all things in the end. He, he's, he's both the judge and he's the creator. And we need to treat him as such. And we need to realize that our loyalty and duty is to him. It's as if we were a king. And working for a king, you know, we want to treat the king like, hey, here's my piso, the king, my buddy, and I'll just do whatever I want. And I know he may not agree with it, but it doesn't matter. No, we should be trying to serve the king and trying to do the best we can and be obedient to the king. And uh, also... I also, I also highlight this, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life. How did he do it? How did he get rid of death? Death is always the enemy. Death is a bad thing. Every one of us is going to die. It's like I said the other week, that guy said to this guy named Tim, that me and Bill know, he said, he was his doctor and the guy had cancer and he said, Doc, am I going to die of this cancer? And he said, you know what, you're going to die of something. I guarantee you're going to die. We're all going to die. There's not a person here that's not going to die. I don't know if it'll be this cancer or not. And then he went out and he witnessed to him as a doctor in a doctor's office, and he tried to bring this guy to Christ. What an amazing thing is that? But, uh, but that is, Jesus has abolished death. He's abolished it. You know, we all must die the first death, but we don't all have to die the second death if we have our faith in Christ. And it says here that he brought life and immortality. That means we live forever with him to light. How did he do it? Through the gospel. And what is the gospel? You can say the gospel in just one simple sense is Jesus died for me. That's the gospel. Jesus died for me. And this is how Jesus did it. He died for us and he's abolished death and everything. And uh, then I also, I, I pointed out here that this right here is a beautiful verse. For I know whom I have believed. You know, he's believed in Jesus. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. You know, over and over again, I'm a firm believer. It's called the doctrine of eternal security. I'm a firm believer that once saved, always saved. It's by grace alone that we're saved. It's not through works. It's not from anything that we do. We can never, ever be good enough to enter into the kingdom of God. No matter how hard we ever try to be, no matter how hard we try to keep the law, we try to keep every word of the Bible, we're never going to be good enough to match up to God's standard. God's standard is so high, none of us can ever, ever achieve it. But through Christ dying for us and being the substitute for us so that we could live forever, He has made us able. It's by His grace alone, and it's by His grace alone that we will stay saved and go all the way to the end to where we go into heaven and become glorified with Him. 
And it shows here that he's able to guard until that day that he's entrusted to him. He, and God's able, and God will. You know, it talks about another place in the Bible. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. We didn't start our own faith. God gave us our faith. Our faith is a free gift, it says in Ephesians 2.8. It's not something that we just decide, I'm going to have faith. God gave us that faith. Now, we can decide on how that faith is going to grow. We can decide, am I going to serve God today and walk after Him? Am I going to search out His Word? Am I going to be in prayer? Am I going to stand up when it's a difficult time in front of opposition and confrontation? Am I going to not be ashamed and stand up for Christ that I can grow? Or am I going to be ashamed and I'm not going to grow and I'm just going to stay this tiny little little child in the faith that never, ever grows up? You know, None of us want that. We want to grow big, we want to grow strong, and we want to grow in Him continuously. And uh, there's another little quote from another fellow who says, The erroneous expectation that Christianity and our culture's values can be compatible leads us to consternation and surprise when society rejects us. All right? And a lot of Christians are always like, I can't believe this stuff's going on. I can't believe they're treating us this way. Jesus said that the world is always going to hate you because it hated him. Why would you think the world would do any different to you as a Christian when it hated the Lord and Master, the creator of the universe? It hated him. It killed him. It nailed him to a cross. So we've got to realize this culture is never going to be compatible to the gospel right there, to the truth. Our faith shudders and our spirits quiver when Christian faith meets hostility or cold indifference. We ought to kind of almost be... Be ready for it. Know that Jesus told us we're going to meet tribulations in this life. We're going to have trouble. We're going to suffer. There's going to be a hard walk ahead of us when we're walking with Christ in a world that hates Him, in a world that's opposed to Him. It says, though we rarely say it so out loud, we cling to the hope that we will be spared the anguish and torment of earlier generations. Yet this hope is false. It leads to spiritual weakness. We cannot face situations for which we are unprepared. And like I told you with the downgrade controversy with Spurgeon, you know, all the people are like, well, we got to be real nice to everybody. We can't mention anything. We just only say Jesus to them. Just Jesus. We preach Jesus. They can live however they want to live. They can follow whatever they want to follow. We can compromise whatever biblical doctrinal teaching we want to talk about. As long as they say Jesus. And that's not how it ought to be. It ought to be we're trying to do the best we can to follow the law, to follow after Christ. But yet knowing the law doesn't save us. But yet the law will purify us. You know, Jesus purifies by his blood. But yet as we grow in Christ... We're going to grow up and we'll go from that little child of faith and keep growing as we continually try to follow it. We're always going to fall short of it. That's why the law can't save us because there's no way that we can do that. But if we love him, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me and you will keep my commandments. Jesus said that. Here it says, we would serve the church better by resolutely committing ourselves to suffer for Christ. You know, already put in our head, you know what? I'm a believer now, I'm going to suffer in this life, but I know I've got a life ahead of me that goes on for 50 billion years and 50 billion times 50 billion years. And this is just a short drop in the bucket compared to what it's going to be in eternity. And in this short time that I have right here in the flesh, I'm going to suffer for Christ. It says, perhaps if we entered each day expecting difficulty rather than avoiding it, we could endure it for His sake. If we knew each day, it's going to be a hard day for me. I'm going to have a hard time today. My walk as a Christian is going to cause me to not fit into the mold, to fit into the way, to fit into the natural way of everything else that's going on in this world. It's not going to work. I'm going to be the odd shape. I'm going to be the square trying to fit into a circle, and it's never going to work. And I'm going to be kind of the oddball through this life as I walk in. If we already prepare ourselves for that each day, it'll be a lot easier for when we hit that opposition. We're like, oh, I expected this. No problem. I got my faith in Christ. So I'll stand in Him. I'm not ashamed. I know that it's Him that is in me that you hate. It's not me personally. It's God who is in me that you hate. And that's why I'm having such opposition. It says, we can endure it for His sake. Then our faith would grow stronger and others would find courage. And we, we would get bigger. We keep growing. That's all I always say. As we evangelize, as we share our faith with other people because we're not ashamed, it makes us grow because people will ask us things and say things to us and we won't know what the answer to it is. So we'll go and we'll look it up. We'll find it. We'll ask some other believer. And then all of a sudden we know what it is. And then the next time we talk to him, we're able to give a better answer, a better defense for our faith. Here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's us making disciples of others. It's about me teaching you and you teaching others. You know, it's not just me teaching, it's you guys teaching as well. We all got to be uh, teachers right there. We're all called to be teachers in some kind of degree of the faith to the lost. 
Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I like this. You guys know I was 20 years in the army. So anytime I see soldier stuff, it makes me all pumped up, all right? And it should make you pumped up too. Because you guys are, even though you're civilians, you're still soldiers in the army of Christ. Every single person is a believer is in the army of the Lord. It says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. That means like we can't get caught up in, in what's going on in the world. We've got to stay focused. You know, like me in the army, when I was in the army and it's time to work and stuff, I couldn't just stop and go do all these other things and maybe some errands and stuff I had to run during the day. I had to be in the army. It's like maybe you guys with your jobs. When you're working at your job, you can't just stop everything at your job and go to the store and hang out for a few hours. You've got to do your job. And that's the same way it is as us following Christ. We've got to be steadfast and realize my job is to serve the Lord. My job is to walk after God. And the same way as we do in our jobs, when we do the jobs of our best of abilities, we should be also trying to strive to serve Christ to the best of our abilities. There's a difference between being active and being passive. Being active means we're actually doing something. We're going toward it. We're active. Passive means we don't do anything at all. We just kind of sit there and wait for something to happen to us. Everywhere in the Bible, it shows an active faith, an active faith that follows God. Sometimes when we're praying, we need to be silent before the Lord, you know, be silent and know that He is God. But even that is being active because we have to choose. We're going to be silent and we're going to listen for the Lord. But there's an active faith that's involved. And it says, here it says, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, if the Lord will give you understanding and everything. Think about this hard-working farmer, too. You know, when a farmer plants stuff, I know some of you guys are like farmers, you grow stuff. I even got some onion, onion seeds today I'm going to start growing here. And I know I've tried to grow some things, and I'm not the best grower of things. But you got to be patient, and you got to put the stuff in the ground the right way. You have to water it. You have to weed it. You know, just the other day, my garden was like two or three feet high in weeds, and I pulled out all these weeds out of the garden, and now my strawberries are coming back again, but the weeds are gone. But it takes work. It's slow. When you're a farmer and you're working, it's not something just fast. It's not like the movies. The movie in the movies, all we see is fast action. It's like. It's like uh, guys ask me about the army sometimes, and like I was in Somalia, I was in combat a couple times, different things. But 99% of the time, it was what we call in the army, hurry up and wait. We would hurry up and get somewhere, all rush like crazy, and wait for hours and hours and hours, and read lots of books, and be really bored. And that's really what a lot of the job was. It, uh, what we see in the movies is the glory. It's 1% of the time, maybe even 0.1% of the time as a way as it really is as a soldier. And it's probably like that if you think of your own careers or something, or own jobs, you think, you know, in my job I wanted to do it for this. Well, probably 1% of the time is what you really wanted to do it for, and the rest of the time it's a bunch of hard work. And that's the way it is with everything in life, and that's the way it is following Christ. It's slow, and sometimes it's hard work. It says, it says here, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. That's, that's what he always preached. He preached Christ crucified. And it says, the only thing I want to know among you is Jesus Christ crucified. That's what he said in, in Corinthians. It says, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. See, it bound him with chains as a criminal. This world looked at him as a, as a criminal, as a lawbreaker, because he was a breaker of this world's law. I don't know if I mentioned it last week, but I meant to. <laughs> But there's this great book called The Pilgrim's Progress. And in The Pilgrim's Progress, there's a place called the Vanity Fair. And in the Vanity Fair, these guys walk into the Vanity Fair, and everybody's up to whatever they love to do. But all of it is against Christ. It's like all a bunch of sins. And everybody's doing all their sins, and the two Christian guys walk in, and they're not sinning. So people are like, why aren't you sinning? Why don't you want to buy this from me? Why don't you want to do this with me? And they say, because we're believers in the Most High King. We're believers in the Most High God. This is where we're following. So then the people hate them, and they think, they're going to hurt my business. People will hear this, and they'll think, I can't sell this, or it's wrong to do this. So they bring them before the court, and then the court ends up killing one of them, and one of them gets to escape. But really, that's the way this world is. This world's like a big, giant Vanity Fair. And we've got to be so careful that we don't get caught up in one of the booths of the Vanity Fair, and we miss going along on the journey of faith that we need to continually going on. But he says here that he's bound with chains as a criminal. So he's down in chains too in this, in this dungeon. But the word of God is not bound. So even though he's in this dungeon, this pit, 
Like I said, this deep, dark, damp dungeon that you can go and visit it and jump in yourself by you pay a lot of money if you go on with the big tourists. But, but you can see this, yet he had joy, yet he was full because the God, because the word of God cannot be bound. Because even though he may be bound in the flesh, he's not bound in the spirit because he knows the eternal light that's coming. He knows this is just a temporary glitch in the road that we have going on. It says, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. All right, who are the elect? The elect is every single person who will ever call in the name of the Lord to be saved. The elect is every single person whomsoever believeth. That is who the elect is. The people who are not the elect are the people who will never call in the name of the Lord and are going to go and face the wrath of God for eternity because they never came to Christ. But he's doing all this for the sake of the elect. And another thing, whenever you see elect and people get all hyped up and crazy, none of us know who the elect are. You know, I can kind of guess who an elect person is because I think this person is confessing Christ as their Savior, right? And they're walking that way. But only God knows who the elect are. I can't look at a guy and think, he's not elect, he's elect. No, I can't do that. So who am I to do? It says in the Bible, I'm to go preach the gospel to the entire world, to love all and to treat all the same way. But God knows who they are, and it's for their sake that we're suffering. It's for their sake that we're doing this because it's the way God set it up. It's God's plan. God's perfect in His plan, so how God made His plan is that we get saved, we teach others, they get saved by the hearing of the Word, as it says in Romans chapter 10, and then they go and teach others. It says here that they also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And that, that's what it's all about, to obtain the salvation, and they go forward in Christ Jesus. And uh, I, I wrote down a few notes here, I wrote that Paul did it for God and for us, not himself. You know, what does he say did it? He said it for the elect, and he's doing it for God. He's not doing it for himself. There wasn't any profit for Paul in this. Paul could have had a really nice life as a Pharisee. He could have lived the high life, had a lot of money, you know, had a nice house, had all those kind of things, the best they had in that day that he, that he lived in. He gave it all up for God and for people right there. That's, that, that's, who, that's who Paul lived for. And uh, we also got to look at our commitment determines our progress. If we're not committed to serving Jesus Christ, our progress, our growth, like I said from the little kid, is not going to keep growing. If we don't have any commitment at all, but just minimal commitment, it's going to be real minimal growth. But the more commitment we have to Christ, the more we're going to grow. It's like a little kid eating the vitamins or something, you know, or a little kid eating the vegetables. The healthier he eats, the stronger he gets, the more he goes to school, the harder he tries to learn what he's trying to learn, he just keeps growing and growing. The kid that's just the minimal effort, that doesn't want to eat his food, that doesn't want to go to school, that doesn't want to learn, it goes a lot slower right there. And fortunately, for God's grace, so many of us may have been in that same situation, maybe are in that same situation, all of a sudden growth spurts start to happen because all of a sudden it just clicks and we realize it. And then we start to follow Christ and we'll grow immensely, quickly. But we need, we need to be following Christ and giving it everything we've got. And we have to stay gospel-focused is how we have to stay. Here, the, uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 2, it says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to run away from those things that are sins that, that cause us to stumble. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And I was reading about this, and it's kind of like I've been trying to get into a lot of involvement with some ministries and other ministers around here. I've talked, I was at the church across the street praying on Thursday with like six different church pastors all praying for one another, praying for the people in the city. Uh, next week, or September 2nd, I go to a pastor's luncheon down here in Medina where there's like 14 pastors come, and we all pray for one another. And we all are from different denominations, but we're all Christian believers. We believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We believe in this is his word. So at least I can get along with all these guys, even some months, some may be Pentecostal, some may be works-based salvation, someone mode, but I can come together with them on the point of Jesus Christ. Now, if they were to attack me and they were to try to attack the doctrines from the Bible that I believe in, then I may have to talk to them and, and go about it right there. But I don't need to, I don't need, I can avoid that stuff and I can keep the peace and I can go forward being centered on Jesus Christ. There's a time to fight, especially if it hits a foundational issue, but then there's also a time to just not fight and to, and to try to be in unity and also try to go forward, show love, and be united in Christ. And Christians are always fighting one another. How are we going to think anybody's going to come to Christ? You know, we've got to, if, we, if they don't see us in unity on one side, 
Why would they ever want to join us on this side? They think they're just as messed up as we are. We want, to, we want to show the example of truth. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. This is what may happen. As we do these things and we treat our opponents, the people who are hating us in this world, that are throwing us in this prison or torturing us, we treat them with gentleness. It says God may perhaps grant them repentance to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. And if you've done much witnessing, you can know it's very hard to try to bring someone to their senses. It's only God that's going to do it. You're going to do the preaching. You're going to do the loving. And it may take years. It may not be right away. It may be like the slow farmer. But it takes a long time. But eventually, they're going to come to their senses and they're going to see it crystal clear. And they're going to wash their minds with the Word of God. And they're going to just grow. And it's going to be amazing. Also in 2 Timothy 3.10, it says, You, however, have followed my teaching, talking to Timothy, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Remember, Lystra is where he was stoned to death. Which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. God rescued him from everything. He's like, I went through a whole lot of stuff, and God was always there for me, rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. See this? This is scripture right here. This is the Bible. It's saying we will be persecuted. There's nobody, if you're not being persecuted for your faith, probably because you're not sharing your faith. You're not talking about your faith. And the people around you don't realize that you're a person of faith. So, and not persecuted to the point where we're being put in prison. Thank God we live in a free country. That's not happening. But persecuted in the sense that maybe people are talking bad about you. People don't always want to be around you. People look at you in a certain way or act a certain way around you that they don't act around others. Those are all kinds of forms of persecution we see today. While I firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, what's the sacred writings? It's the scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. All scripture. And this doesn't just talk about the New Testament. This doesn't just talk about what Timothy's writing. Because over in, uh, in 2 Peter 3.16, just like this is 3.16, it's an easy way to remember it. He says all the writings of Paul were scripture. So the Bible testifies about itself. It says the writings of Paul were scripture. Over half the New Testament is scripture written by Paul. And it says here, and then also they use scripture in reference to the old days too. With the Old Testament and the scrolls and Moses' things. But it says all scripture, not just some of it. There's not words that shouldn't be there. There's not chapters that shouldn't be there. There's not concepts that shouldn't be there. Every single word in the Bible is from God, and it's God's truth. If we don't take all of it, we should take none of it. Because how are we to know what's there and what's not? We're making up a fictitious, fictional God in our own mind. If we think, well, my God, he only does this. I don't care what the Bible says. My God doesn't do that. Well, your God is the devil is who your God is. Because it says in the Bible that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. If you're shortchanging yourself by trying to say some scripture isn't from God, I guarantee you if you would do a serious word study, a serious biblical study, you would have a ton of things just banging against each other that have all kinds of controversies and don't make sense at all with your view because your view is a man-made view and all our man-made stuff has faults. Like I said, none of us can be perfect. It says it's profitable for teaching, for reproof. That means fixing us. You know, every single one of us needs fixed. Not one of us doesn't. Don't think I'm saying you need fixed. I don't need fixed. I need fixed every single day. For correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God, or woman of God, this is like a generic man of God here, okay, may be complete, equipped for every good work. Why is all this scripture good here? That you may be complete and ready for every single good work. Why are you saved? It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 through 10, that you are saved for good works. Sometimes we can get so bent on one side that we lose the other side. That's why we say it's a road that we're traveling. One side of the road is liberalism. It's the far left liberalism. It doesn't believe the Bible so. It's been edited. There's all kinds of mess up stuff. That's dead wrong. Points out here. They also, the other side of liberalism is that I'm so bound up in legalism that I have to follow every T and make everybody else follow every T that I lose sight of the big picture right there. And that's easy to bump into that side too. We've got to walk down the middle of this road that's not legalistic. And it's not liberal. And we got it. And the reason we're doing this is so we may be complete. So we'll be holy, God, and we'll be ready for every good work as we go down this road. If we're on the legalism side, I guarantee I've seen it myself. We're not good for every good work. We show a lot of unloving type characteristics, a lot of unloving lashing out at people and whipping people with our words. That doesn't get anybody saved. That doesn't do any good truth at all right there. That's that 
being quarrelsome, we talked about over little controversies and stuff. We should be preaching Christ crucified. Yes, we have to preach that they're a sinner, that they're fallen, that they need Christ, but in such a way that's with love, with gentleness, with grace, with compassion. Not in such a way that just makes them think, oh, get away from me, you crazy idiot. We don't want that to happen. We've got to do it with love, gentleness, and patience. But we do have to do it. And then we also always have to make sure we take them to a John 3.16 to show that Jesus died for them, that this is the love of the Father, and this is the way. You're not hopeless. You have a way. Every single person has a way if you believe in Christ. And it says that we're equipped for every good work. Now here it says, I charge you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. Like I said, he's the creator and he's the judge. And by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. This is the most common used verse when someone gets ordained. When someone gets ordained, like they lay on hands on him and they ordain him to go be a minister, the group and the body recognize that this guy is called by God to go be a minister, to be an elder of the church. It says, that they use this verse and says, preach the word. This is the most important thing. If the guy forgets all other things, at least preach the word. Don't forget the Bible and leave the Bible out. The Bible is our main curriculum. It's God's curriculum. It's not ours. It says, be ready in season and out of season. You know, when you're when you're ready and when you're not ready, you know, be ready in the middle of the night when somebody gives you a call. Be ready when you're when you're you're, you're not ready. You got to always be ready. You got to be standing strong. You always got to have your armor of God on. It says reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Look, these are two negative things, and then a positive one. Exhort that means to encourage. You know, so yeah, we're gonna kind of beat the people up a little bit, and then we're gonna encourage them how to go the right way and show them a whole lot of love. We're not gonna beat them up and leave the encouragement out, okay? It's important. We do to leave, get the encouragement in there as well. And when we beat the people up, we do it as gently as possible right there, okay? It's not us that's, that's accusing them. It's not us that judge them. It's the Word of God that judges them and accuses them. It's the Holy Spirit that will do it through their conscience. It says with complete patience and teaching. See this patience? When we get into the side of legalism, patience usually flies right out the door. We've got to have patience and teaching and love and passion. For the time is coming when people would not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into many myths. And I know almost every one of us could name some kind of preachers or teachers or something that's preaching something different than the gospel of Christ. That's preaching something that just makes a whole bunch of people happy with itching ears and they're wandering off into myths. You know, myths are made up stuff. Greek mythology, Zeus and all that. It's just a made up religion. It's all fake and it's all made up. And people would rather hear that than to hear the truth is what it's saying. And it's still going on today, for sure. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Endure it. it. doesn't say run away from it. It says to endure it. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. An extra demonstration of this, if I had more time, was to have like a bowl. And you have a cup. And you just pour it out. And that's how he showed my life is poured out as a drink offering. Everything I have in this world is completely poured out for Christ. I'm not keeping a little in here just in case. I'm pouring it out, out every single drop. And it says that's how we ought to be. And he look what Paul says. He says, I have fought the good fight. Praise God. Look at this. He's in his last days writing this. Who knows if it was the next day or if it was next, within the next month that he was killed. Within days, they said he was chopping two with a sword. But he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is what I said. Kept the faith. It's all about keeping the faith. That's what Paul did. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Isn't that amazing? And like I said before, whenever I run a race, whenever I run, it's that last mile that's the hardest to run. It's always when you're at the end is the hardest to finish. You just want to be like, oh, I've had enough. I just want to stop. I want to walk. It's just too much, and it's like a mental thing that plays on you. You may be running three miles, you may be 10, you may be doing a 26-mile marathon, but it's always the last mile that gets you. You may have done a 26-mile marathon, and now you're going to run a three-mile race, still that last mile is going to get to you, and you're like, oh, and you've got to reach down inside yourself, and the military we call it intestinal fortitude, and grab deep within and be like, I will not quit, I will continue on, I will not give up no matter what. That's what that guy told me. I got interviewed by John, uh, John Laufman on 1220 The Word this week, and they played it on Wednesday. If you want to listen to it, just go to the 1220 The Word, and they got a podcast on there. But he kept saying, well, how did you do all this stuff in the military? And I said, I, I didn't quit. I did not quit. I would not give up. I thought, you know what, I'll never make it. I thought hopeless a lot of things, but I thought, I just won't quit. I'll make them 
throw me out, but I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to do anything to make you throw me out. I'm going to do the very best I can, and I made just about everything I put my hand to. And that's, uh, that's what Paul's saying, you know, don't quit, continue on. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, you know, Demas left him. And three other places in the epistles, Demas has talked about really good. He's somebody who confessed Christ. He's somebody that hung out with the apostles. He's somebody that went on the journey of evangelism. Look what he did. He left him because, why? Because he was in love with this present world. This world is supposed to, supposed to be an enemy. God is an enemy with this world, the way this world is. But Demas was in love with it, and he left him and deserted him, went back to Thessalonica. Over in 1 John 2, 19, it says, For those who leave, the reason they left is because they were never really there in the first place. He was never even saved in the first place. He was on the journey, but it was never genuine. Luke is alone with me. He's the only guy that's there with him, poor fellow. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychius I have sent to Ephesus. It's where he was a preacher for three years, Paul. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Campus and Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Isn't this guy saying he was cold? He was cold inside this dark dungeon. And he tells him to, to bring my coat. I left it. He's probably saying, I wish I didn't leave my coat. Oh, is it cold here? Is it miserable? And he says, bring the parchments. You know, parchments where the scriptures were written, all those Old Testament scriptures. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. We can only imagine what this coppersmith did to poor Paul, you know, to do him great harm for him to write something like this. Because Paul was forgiven of guys who stoned him to death and did all kinds of things. This guy harmed him greatly, it says. Who knows what he did, what kind of torture, what things. It says, beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. In my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. Isn't that sad? You know, it's probably just like Jesus. When Jesus went and was being dragged away, Peter denied him three times. But now one of his apostles stood up and said, Hey, that's my Lord. I'm sticking with him. What he believes, I believe. We didn't see that from one of them. Not a one of them did that. The same with Paul, too, in his day. No, and nobody stood with him when it was time for him to be, uh, for him to stand at defense and trial. May not be charged against them. Look at this. Forgiveness. He's forgiving these guys. Even though nobody stood up for him, his best buddies and comrades left him at the most crucial time. He says, forgive him. May not be charged against him. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. And that's who we can know. The rock will always stand by us. No matter what, Jesus is on our side. He's not somebody we have to fear and be totally afraid of. He's somebody we can know. We can know as a friend. Yes, he's our Lord. He's our master. But he's also on our side and he's for us. He's not against us. We read that in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, if you're going to believe, you have to first believe that he exists. And you also have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You can't think, oh, I believe he exists, but is he going to do me bad, I think, one day? No, we've got to believe God is going to do us good one day when we're serving him, when we're following after him. He's on our side. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. And that's like a thing like saying from torture and all kinds of things, an a old uh, way to say that. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the... Uh, and we can see this, you know, it's, we see the passion, we can see all these things, you know, that he lost everything for the sake of Christ, and, uh, and, that, that, and that it was important, and that he's trying to encourage Timothy to do the same thing, to walk after him, and to, uh, to be the same way. But we, uh, we sometimes, we, we forget, sometimes we get caught up, sometimes we get, like I said, we get caught up and maybe we're standing in the booth at the Vanity Fair, and we've got to pull ourselves away from that booth and get back to following the way that he told us to go. You know, it's like, uh, like he told Elijah, when Elijah was depressed, he's like, God, just kill me, I just want to die. God said, get up and go back the way you came. Go back to where you were, go back to what you ran away from, and face it, and continue on. And that's the same way we got to do every day. I got a quick story here called the Omaha 10,000, all right? When Bill Broadhurst was 18, an aneurysm occurred on the right side of his brain, leaving the left side of his body partially paralyzed. By the time he was 28, he was able to walk without the use of a cane. Although stiff hampered by a still-legged limp, it no longer prevented him from pursuing his interest in running. The marathon in Omaha, Nebraska, like races all over the country, began predictably. The gun sounded and the runners flooded through the street. As in most contests, the leaders become apparent early on. Bill Rogers' lean in practice was among the front runners. Bill Broadhurst, among the throng at the beginning, was now running considerably behind. I mean, this is a guy that was left partially paralyzed. Rogers won the race, covering the distance in less than 30 minutes, fast by any standard. Other runners were not far behind, bringing in competitive times as they sprinted across the finish line. Joggers and weekend marathoners clocked in at an hour or more, 
The stragglers and the weary finished after about two hours. After two hours and 20 minutes, Bill Broadhurst continued to run. I can totally picture this going on. Why? Because sometimes I'm at the front of the pack, I'm at the back of the pack. <laughs> there was no one in sight. His left side felt numb. A child seeing him struggling along by himself yelled, Hey, mister, you missed the race. Broadhurst's body screamed with pain, but he kept going. He wanted to finish. As a believer, he thought of 1 Corinthians 9.27, where Paul, speaking of running a race with endurance, said, I beat my body and make it my slave. You know, that's the kind of attitude we should have. I beat my body and make it my slave. Broadhurst wanted to finish his race. Two hours and 30 minutes after the starting gun, the sky was darkening. The police were gone. No crowds pressed along the streets to catch glimpses of the runners. Tables cluttered with water cups could no longer be found along the route. Broadhurst limp worsened, his left leg almost dragging as he pushed himself on. He began to wonder if it was worth all the effort. Everything hurt. Finally, he caught sight of the end point. As he hobbled along, he saw that the finish banner no longer fluttered over the street. It was already packed away for next year's race. The place was deserted. His heart sank as he realized how far behind he had run. How long ago the race had ended. On the dark street with no one watching, what difference would it make if he crossed an imaginary finish line? But he did. As he did, from out of the alleyway stepped Bill Rogers and a small group of people. Stumbling across the finish line, Broadhurst was welcomed by the outstretched arms of the champion, the hero. Taking the gold medal from around his own neck, Rogers put it on Broadhurst, declaring him the winner. What a, what a great guy that is, huh? It was a moment of victory, more electric perhaps than two hours earlier when the crowds had cheered Bill Rogers across the line. Soon after the struggles and weariness of this life, we will also cross the finish line to meet our hero and savior, Jesus Christ. As we step across the finish line, he will step out, not from the shadows, but from the blaze of his own glory. He will give us the gold, the crown of his own righteousness, for he has run the race before us perfectly. Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, 21. He will say to those who endure to the end. So let us be like Paul and finish strong. You know, that's what good leadership teaching says. It says, it says uh, you know, start good and finish well. You know, start well, finish well. We've got to finish well. We've got to keep going that race, just like Paul did. Look at him as an example when things get tough in your life and think, Paul did it. I can do it too. Christ is in me and he is greater than he's in the world and I can do it. I used to love that old army saying, they changed it a few sayings back, but it said, be all you can be. That's a great saying right there. That's how we ought to be as Christians. Be all we can be. We know it's only by the grace of God we're anything. We know it's only by the grace of God we're saved, but we ought to be trying to be everything we can be as a Christian and a believer stand up for him, knowing that in the end, all that really matters is what we did for Christ. All that really matters is what we did with Jesus in our life. Everything else is going to be gone. You know, it doesn't mean that we neglect the good things in this life. We should enjoy them as well. But on a higher note, Jesus is always above everything else in our life. He's, he's above it all. And uh, that's where we have to stand and stay. But if, if you bow your heads with me, we'll